developers don't know jack about security. That's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? But I'm sure a lot of you think or assume that many of security people have that belief that developers don't know jack about security. And to be fair, a lot of them do. There was actually a famous quote from a security conference in 2011, developers don't know jack about security. One of the security people by the name of John Willander responded with, well, I got news for you. You don't know jack about development. This is a real problem. The security people don't really think that developers know what they're doing. Developers can't give a damn about what the security people are saying because they're not working in the same way. There's a real conflict. There's a lot of friction between the two groups. And that's a real problem because we need you to be building soft secure software. And if we give you the tools, I'm sure you can do it. You know how to do it. You're all competent software, so you're all amazing. And that can definitely be done. Uh, the problem is, and I've been doing this for a lot of years, been building secure life cycles, secure processes into development groups. And a lot of times there's a lot of friction when we try and implement this. Okay? The problem is, <clears throat> excuse me. The problem is if the security teams keep fighting developers and developers keep fighting security teams, we're gonna keep you know, getting stuck and using the same techniques. We're gonna be stuck in the same place. We can't adapt to use different techniques, different um, aspects, different approaches, depending on where we are. So I'm going to show you how to do this, how to combine security into your lifecycle, into your development process. Okay? One of these massive tools is called threat modeling. Does anybody here familiar with threat modeling or do threat modeling? In the case, not a lot, and I'm sure those of you that have done it have a lot of complaints, have seen a lot of friction, and I'm going to talk about some of those, fric some of those objections and how to deal with them. <clears throat> So threat modeling, I'm going to, for those not familiar with it, I will explain what it is in a few moments. But threat modeling has been proven time and time again to be one of the most effective security activities we could do when building a system to keep it secure. Okay, I'm going to explain how to do that. And the point is that I don't want just security people to be doing this. We've been talking about cross-functional teams in threat modeling long before Agile has been around to talk about that. The problem is it doesn't really work well. There's too much friction when it comes to development lifecycle. And I'm going to show how to try and get over that. I'm going to show how to be able to implement this without all that friction. The key to this, of course, is to make it quick. Don't spend a lot of time. Don't have to spend several sprints worth of time doing security. And of course, make this part of the agile uh, process. The key to this is focusing on business value. And what are the goals of the system that you're building? So let me introduce myself. My name is Avi Duglin. Those are my contact details. You might have seen my Tigger face all over the internet. I tend to ramble on. The important things you need to know about me, if you ever want to buy me a drink, is I like my whiskey smoky. I like my coffee, my beer stout. I like my coffee strong. This is very important. I do have five kids at home. Some other things you might be interested to know about me is that I have a small security consultancy called Bounce Security. We do research, development, architecture. I'm a community moderator on Security Stack Exchange. Anybody familiar with it? Not so much. I'm sure you're all familiar with Stack Overflow. There's a whole set of sister sites, Stack Overflow. One of them is Security Stack Exchange. Exactly like Stack Overflow, Q&A, but about security. It's very worthwhile. I'm also one of the leaders of the Israel chapter of OWASP, and also the project leader for the Threat Model Project. If you're not familiar with OWASP, you should be, and I'd like you to be familiar with it. <clears throat> it's called the Open Web Application Security Project. Uh, this is an organization open source, free, everything, just to produce secure software. Okay, so there's libraries that you can use to build security into your product. There's tools that you can use to scan or build or whatever it is. There's a lot of guides for secure coding in Python and every other language you want. In Israel, the, the chapter here has been around for around a dozen years, and we have a fantastic conference in September, free conference, so I don't mind saying it here. Free conference is September 6th. And September 5th, we're going to have a full day, again, free training for secure coding. I really hope to see a lot of you there. All right, so let's talk about threat modeling. What is threat modeling? Threat modeling is a methodology or a framework, whatever you want to call it, a way to have structured analysis of the security level of your application. Okay, I'll show how to do this, but this is a design activity. Okay, so it's not something that can be completely automated because it's part of the design. And the point is to, number one, know what the attack spec could possibly be that you need to defend against. You understand what the risk of that, those attacks are, how bad they really are, and then you can prioritize according to that. You don't want to fix everything. You want to fix only the important things. 
it helps us focus. Okay? We don't need to spend a lot of money on, on time and budget on all kinds of things that are less important. We want to just take the most important things. It helps communicate between teams. It's something that Andrew was talking about earlier. It helps communicate the security issues between the teams and why we're fixing them. Okay? And obviously, if you're fixing something you want to have it documented, you want to have it written down, why you're actually fixing this. So how is it actually done? So classically, typically, threat modeling is based on a few different things. You take the data flows, you know, where the data flows between the application, between the different components, the attack surface, how it comes into the application, how the attacker can talk to the internal components, different flows between the internal components, how it goes. Okay? Usually, you want to focus on assets, you know, you know, databases and files and different things like that, and be able to protect what's important to you, right? Protect the data. That's usually one of the most important things or different components. And you focus on the trust boundaries, you know, things that comes from a user you might not trust, you want to be able to spend a little bit more time modeling the users that you don't trust. It's very easy to do this with diagrams, DFDs, data flow diagrams. Here's one as an example. So you have down here on the bottom, you have the data stores, you have the different files, databases, you have a process talking to all of them. And up there near the top, you have the user sending a request into the process. And as you can see, crosses the trust boundary so that's going to be something that we're not going to trust. We don't trust that user. We want to spend a bit more time modeling that. Obviously, that's going to be one of the first places we start. So what does this process actually look like? It's a four-step process. And before the process, we start with step minus one, or step zero, where we scope the model. Because obviously, we can't model everything all at once. So we're going to decide which parts of the architecture are in our model, which components, which services, and so forth. Once we decided on our scope, we're going to decompose the application. We take the design, the architecture, we break it down to individual components, data flows, and so on. And then based on that, and I'll show you some techniques in a moment, based on that, we can identify what our threats are. We understand how the threats can be exploited. And based on that, we understand the risk level, and therefore we can prioritize it. Once we understood the threats, it's pretty simple to design the mitigations, to design the protections against these threats. And then, of course, we want to analyze what we did. Did we find all the threats? Did we find the important ones? Right? Did we fix the threats? Now, how do we actually find those threats? So here's a few different techniques, a few different approaches. The classic Microsoft one is called Stride or Stride by Element. There's a few other ones called Attack Trees, Asset Focus, Software Centric, a few different ones, Risk Based. Let's take a look at Stride by Element. So Stride is a mnemonic. It's an acronym for spoofing pretending to be somebody you're not. Tampering, changing data you shouldn't have access to. Repudiation, claiming you didn't do something that you did. For example, telling the bank that you didn't authorize a bank transfer, a money transfer. Information disclosure, getting access, reading data that you shouldn't have access to. Denial of service, preventing access to users that should have that access. And elevation of privileges, doing something you shouldn't be allowed to, or doing something you should be allowed to on data you shouldn't be allowed to do that action on. So this is a mnemonic, okay? It's not strict categorization. Uh, one, a single threat can fall into more than one category. We don't need to start arguing about, is this threat a spoofing attack or is it an elevation of privileges attack? It doesn't matter. The point is it's a mnemonic. It's to, to kickstart your brainstorming, to try and think what those possible attacks could be, okay? So this is very easy. This is basically the six categories of possible attacks at a technical level. Now, how do we actually use this? Here's another data flow diagram that's a bit more complicated. For each one of these components on the, data, uh, on the DFD, you take the stride threats, stride categories, and apply them to each element <clears throat> and ask, are there spoofing attacks? For example, between the user, between the browser and the web server, the browser sends a request, are there spoofing attacks here? Can the browser, can the server pretend to be a different server, a bogus server? Can the user pretend to be a different user? If it wasn't HTTPS, would I be able to change data in the flow? And we go through the entire category for each one of these elements. And you can apply this to internal elements also. Take a look at the messaging bus over there, the single point before all the application messages go into the mainframe. Are there spoofing threats here? Can I put up a bogus message bus to intercept all messages? Possibly. Can I pretend to be the application server and send bogus messages into the messaging bus? Can I intercept and change the data that's being sent by the application server to the message bus? Or can I read some sensitive data? And I'll, you go through the entire set of stride for each of these elements. 
Now, what's really cool, this, at this point, it's still pretty basic, pretty technical, and there's a lot of tools that you can run to automatically get to spit out a long list of technical threats that are relevant according to your uh, design, according to your DFD. <clears throat> And you can just go through that and decide this is relevant or this is not relevant, and you get a long list, and you have uh, Microsoft has a tool, uh, TMT, and there's a Tutamantec which comes out, which annotates your DFD, and there's a lot of very interesting tools for that. <clears throat> you can apply this also to a process diagram, <clears throat> pretty much the same thing. Uh, attack trees are very interesting. You define what the logical level, the goal is the attacker wants to achieve. For example, the attacker wants to read other users' messages. So there's a few different paths for that attacker to achieve that goal. Okay, a few different vectors of attack, a few different ways to achieve it. And for each one of those vectors, there needs to be some kind of mitigation in place. That's the bottom row there. And if it's very easy to see that you have different uh, var uh, variants of paths into that goal, and if you see one that's not protected against, you need to go ahead and fix that. <clears throat> Another interesting one is called PASTA, Process for Attack Simulation and Threat Analysis. Uh, one of the authors was Italian. I think he was hungry when he wrote it. Um, so it's basically, it's a way to really get in depth based on a lot of data and simulate what a, a real life attacker might want to do and takes the same four step process before and breaks it down to seven steps. And it's a lot more in depth, a lot more formal based on statistics and data analysis and so on and so forth. Now, this is really, really great for the security team. It's fantastic for a uh, chief risk officer of an international bank. It's fantastic for consultants like me, you know, uh, unending work, you know, thousands of dollars of billables. That's fantastic. But we're not at a security conference. Okay? We're not at Black Hat or DEF CON. We're here at PyCon. Now, I know that this process does not work well in a development flow. I know because I've been on both sides of that table, and it doesn't work. Okay? There's too much friction involved. It takes too much time. This is not an agile process. Almost everything else we can do agile. Uh, almost everything else of the security process we can do agile. Threat modeling is the one thing that we've always had a problem with. And here's a few objections that have come up with. And even teams that do manage to implement threat modeling in a good way still have these friction. And this is still some of the problems. So here's some of the problems that we've seen. Okay? Number one, I'm sure you've all heard this, and that's a load of crap. You know, I've been there, I've had eight bosses, eight bosses, Bob, I don't want to be number nine, okay? I don't want this to be your job because your job is to build software, it's to add value to the business, okay? Security doesn't necessarily add value, okay? Sure, it's one of your responsibilities, you gotta do it right, blah, 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 but it's not the main job. So you can't just stop your main job to go and do security. Of course, we could lock everybody in a meeting room for two days or send it off to a consulting, come back three weeks later. You know, the sprint's not gonna wait for that. Anybody hear this? When you want to protect against attacks, just think like an attacker. Try and imagine everything bad that the attacker might want to do. I, you know what? Everybody stop what you're doing. Everybody think like a professional chef. That's not really helpful. It doesn't give you guidance. It doesn't really produce anything of value. Agile really doesn't like the concept of big design up front. And if you try and build a big model up front without a big design, well, you're going to get stuck. You're better off just thinking about what's right in front of you. And more generically, uh, in general, um, threat model likes to have details, spec, kind of a use case approach. And for having a user story approach, that's just a conversation. We'll flesh out the details later. We don't necessarily have that up front. So we can't really build a threat model based on details that we don't have yet. Security people love the documentation, don't they? They love to have a big pile of documentation and you, know, you can pull out all kinds of information about the security from one documentation, but as you're developing your design, you don't have that information. You're reading the design, you don't have the security information, and of course, you do update the design, the threat model's out of, out of date, the, th the consultant comes back three weeks later, here's your threat model, oh yeah, that's not even relevant anymore, what do you even want from me? <clears throat> and of course, one of the big things about threat modeling is that you decide what to build protections against. And that's great that you don't wind up building protections against things that are not important, but you still waste a lot of time modeling these threats that you don't know that they're not important until you actually finish modeling them. And of course, you're all stallions. You all love building good, fast code. That's what you want to do, build it as fast as possible. That's the point of Agile. And us security people, well, we just like to tear things apart. We'd like you all to believe that we have an army of drones 
in our you know, security team, but it's not really true. Statistics came out recently that for every 100 developers, there is one security person. Now, if I'm the only one in the team doing security, you guys are building a whole lot of software without any security. We need you all folks to be doing that. And of course, as a consequence of this, the security person is not part of the team. Every six weeks or so, they drop in, everybody stop. Tell me what you've been doing till now. Start over. Yeah, that's not really, uh, that's not really part of the flow. That creates friction. And of course, we security team get locked out very often, justifiably so in many cases, because you can't wait. You got to go. Now, this is a real problem because if you're not using some form of threat modeling activity, you're basically going to be dealing with this downstream. And that's a lot more work. Okay, so you're just going to be throwing it downstream. And if you're not using the right tools for it, you're going to be winding up spending a whole lot of energy not going in the right direction. So let's break it down. The point of threat modeling is to answer these four questions. Number one, what are you building? There's the DFD, the system design, and so forth. Um, what can go wrong? These are the threats, is what Andrew was talking about earlier. Okay, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to fix these threats? And did we do a good job? Did you find all the threats, and did you actually fix them? All threat models are wrong, some are useful. Andrew Shostak, who literally wrote the book on threat modeling, likes to repeat this quote a lot. And if there's one thing you take from my talk, make it be this. All threat models are wrong, some are useful. All those methodologies were security people's attempt to try and make the threat model as correct as possible. But this is a truism. All threat models are wrong. That's fine. Grab it with both hands. Accept that it's wrong. Lean into it. Make it as useful as possible. Optimize for usefulness, no matter how wrong it is. So I'm going to take those four questions and change them a bit with a slight change in perspective. Number one, why are we building this? What is the goal? What is the business value that you get out of building this user story? Why is this user story getting built now instead of something else? Usually, you get more money, making more money, more eyeballs, more users, whatever it is, there's some benefit to this feature that the business decided this is important to build right now. So what is that goal? Number two, what needs to happen? What are the conditions? What's the situation that needs to go right in order to achieve that goal? Okay. And number three, how do we ensure that those conditions take place? How do we ensure that situation happens? Now, this is really the same questions as before with a slight change in perspective. Um, this is, the next slide is kind of, uh, kind of shocking, especially to security people, and it probably creates the most friction between developers and security people. This is the big difference. And security people, as uh, Andrew was saying, security people like to think about everything that can go wrong. Everything is bad. Okay, so what does this process actually look like? So number one, we're not going to start everything from the beginning. We're going to start from a certain baseline. Okay? We assume that all our developers are competent. We assume that we have a certain level of code hygiene. Okay? So we're not going to spend two days in a room saying, oh, you know what, we need to deal with cross-site scripting attacks or SQL injection. We're not going to wait for three weeks for a consultant to come back and say, oh, you should put SSL on your web servers. You know, that's kind of obvious. We don't need to model all those things. That's an assumption. Sure, we probably need some level of security training. That's great. So for each user story or epic, as you discover it, as you have that conversation, we're going to put the threat model into the user story. Okay? Just enough design, we have just enough threat model. That's all you need. For the, whatever you're designing, that's the level of threat model you need. So how do we actually do it? We find the value for each user story. What is the goal of this user story? Usually, it's making more money. Follow the money. Sometimes, if you're building uh, airplane systems or medical devices, it's how do people die. Okay? So you find the value, follow the money, how do people die? Okay? Based on that, this is the, these are the story goals. You want to ensure this happens. What are the conditions? What is the situation? And be explicit. Again, as Andrew was mentioning also, be explicit about what happens when this goes wrong. Okay? What happens in the failure states? And that's it. This is the minimally viable threat model. That's all you really need to know. Okay? Now, I don't have enough time to give you some techniques. Um, I wanted to show you an example. So I'm going to just jump ahead through this example and just give you some really last minute things. Number one is acceptance criteria. You define whatever those conditions are, whatever those assumptions. Define in the acceptance criteria that these are validated. And of course, you're building unit tests anyway, make security unit tests okay, to validate those assumptions as defined in the acceptance criteria. 
A user story is exactly like a user story, or rather an evil user story, except from the perspective of the evil user. As an attacker, I want to try a large number of passwords so that I can impersonate another user and steal their juice box. Okay? And then that lets you flesh that out. A threat permit is a conceptual device to know, much like, um, <clears throat> like a food permit or Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where you need to focus your time. There's no point in focusing on denial of service attacks when you're subject to remote code execution attacks. But you can apply this also to the value driven. Okay? What is the value of this application? Obviously, <clears throat> you want to cut out uh, access to the bank account before you deal with stolen juice and so on. <clears throat> One quick last thing before I get hit the summary is story points. Everybody's familiar with how to apply those. In the same way, you can apply story points. Doomsday scenarios. How bad would it be if everything goes sideways and blows up in your face? Okay, so I'm going to skip the benefits because I think you all understand that. I want to get to number one, limitations. This is not a complete threat model. You're missing a lot of things. Sometimes you do need something else. You need a security champion as part of the team to lead that effort. Okay, and I'm going to leave you with one last summary and we're going to jump into QA. Um, and there's one thing you take from my talk, make it be this. No, I said that before. Ignore the other one. This is the most important thing. Shut up. Um, just start threat modeling. Okay? You'll get it wrong the first time. That's fine. The second time, it'll be useful. The third time, might even have some real value. And that's fine. It's okay that it's wrong. Just make it be part of your development workflow. Focus on the business value and protect that. Eventually, you might need something more, but that's enough. All right. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? How would you do that in Python? <laughs> That's a fair question, but usually at the level of the user story design, you're not even talking about what languages, it doesn't matter. So this is more of a design activity rather than what language you're using. But Python has really good support for user tests, for, uh, for unit tests. And you can definitely build out a lot of security unit tests in Python. So that would actually make a time for a whole other talk in itself. So yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.